All right, today we're going to do chapter 8. Um, this deals with reactions of alkenes, other than the simple addition that we did in chapter 7. We're going to look at a variety of addition reactions and some oxidation reactions. This is the addition of halogen acid. We talked about that in chapter 7. We remember that this has Markhonikov regiochemistry. Regiochemistry describes um, the orientation of the reagents, the region of the reaction, etc. Uh, we know that this also has a carbocation intermediate. We'll review that. Today we'll also note that if we use hydrogen peroxide or hydrogen bromide in the presence of peroxides, then we get an exactly opposite result. That is, we have anti-Markhonikov regiochemistry with a radical intermediate. X2 is the addition of halogen. We will do, we will see that this is anti or trans. You give a one two dihalide. HOX like hypobromite, hypohalite. This is going to be very similar, actually, to the addition of halogen. Again, we have trans addition. We'll do hydration, where we put a hydroxyl group and hydrogen on. We'll also do a more civilized hydration using mercury to acetate. This is hydroboration oxidation. Again, this gives us an alcohol, but with anti-Markhonikov regiochemistry. Reduction by hydrogen and platinum. <clears throat> we will make 1,2-diols using either permanganate or osmium tetroxide. <clears throat> and we'll look at a couple examples of carbene addition. Here we're making dichlorocarbene. This is carbene itself and we make cyclopropanes. Finally, the last set of reactions we'll do, in the presence of simple peroxide, we'll see we can convert an alkene to an epoxide. <clears throat> With ozone, we can split an alkene to make aldehydes and ketones. And finally, with <clears throat> acidic permanganate, we can also split it make acids, CO2, and ketones. Now there's a lot of reactions here. We're going to deal with these mechanistically. I think if you look at them mechanistically, you can group them easily in your mind, and they're not so overwhelming. <clears throat> we talked about this in chapter 7. Once again, this is the simple addition of halogen acid to an alkene. This works nicely for HBr, HI, and HCl. HF does not work. We noted that this gave us Markhonikov regiochemistry. That is, when we do the addition here, we form a carbocation. The most stable carbocation is formed. The uh, second step in the reaction is the addition of halogen to um, halogen anion to the carbocation. 
we wind up with um, the halogen being bonded to the most stable carbon cation. Once again, this is Montanikov regiochemistry. Any questions on this guy? All right. Well, like I said, we did this one in Chapter 7. We know that if we took this simple alkene, we would look and say, if we had a carbocation here, it would be secondary. If we had a carbocation here, it would be primary. The secondary one will be formed. Allergen will add there. And that's our Montanikov product. However, if you do this reaction in the presence of peroxide, <coughs> what you get is the opposite regiochemistry. Instead of the bromine being bonded to the secondary carbon, it's bonded to the primary carbon. Now you have to have peroxides present. What do we mean by peroxides? <coughs> this is an example of an organic peroxide. Um, peroxides have an unstable oxygen-oxygen single bond. These will undergo homolytic cleavage. When they do, they form a pair of oxygen radicals. The reason that this gives different regiochemistry is that this is a radical reaction. What happens first is we generate our radicals just by homolytic cleavage. Next, the radical itself, one of these oxygen radicals, is going to react with HBr. When it does, it will abstract the hydrogen atom and will leave us with the bromine wax. The bromine radical is the species that's going to add to the alkene isosome. <clears throat> the reason that we're going to get opposite regiochemistry is that when this thing adds to the alkene isosome, it's going to form a radical. Just like we formed the most stable cation, here we're going to form the most stable radical. So the way this works is this way. There's our alkene, and here is the bromine radical. Bromine radical is going to interact with the pi system, and it's going to remove an electron. When it does that, it's going to leave a radical here. Now this is a secondary radical. <coughs> If we had added the bromine radical here, we would form a primary radical. Just like with carbon cations, you want to form the most stable intermediate. Radical stability generally parallels carbon cation stability. So the secondary radical is the most stable radical you could form. So, once we form the secondary radical, we simply need to react with another mole of HBr. The carbon radical will pull off a hydrogen radical. There it is. And will leave us with a bromine radical that continues the reaction. Bottom line, we want to add in order to form the most stable radical. Just like we did the most stable carbon cation, this is the most stable radical. Any questions? Now, this is a spin density map. Um, spin density, again, is a calculation. Um, <coughs> each of these are radicals. This is a methyl radical. This is a butyl radical. Um, with the methyl radical, you can see we have this p orbital here, and that's where the electron lives. <coughs> the spin density is basically localized 
in this region. With the met methyl radical, this is planar. You'll note that with the term butyl radical, again, we have the, the orbital here, but we're kind of buckled a bit from planarity. <coughs> we'll see that later as we do um, <coughs> radicals, I think, in chapter 10. But the important thing to note here is that the calculation tells us that the spin, that is where this electron lives, isn't just confined to this orbital, but it also actually shows up on all these hydrogens that are attached. So we are delocalizing radical over a larger area, and that's why this is more stable than the simple methyl or even a primary or secondary. Any questions? Basically, same sorts of things you see with carbocations, you will see with radicals. All right, let's go ahead and do some examples. Quickly jot down products for these simple reactions. On the exam, <coughs> quite often you will have one or two mechanistic questions <coughs> for these types of uh, reactions. And what I ask you to do is, I have little boxes, and I ask you to draw the intermediate. So here I would ask you to draw the most stable radical, and then the final part. So let's practice that too. With this exocyclic double bond, methylene cyclohexane is called, <clears throat> this would be a primary radical, that would be a tertiary radical. So the most stable radical would look like this. <clears throat> bromine adds to the primary carbon, bromine radical does, to form the tertiary radical. Once we have the tertiary radical, we're simply going to abstract a hydrogen, put it here, and that's our final product. <clears throat> Go ahead and do the next one. This would give us a secondary radical. This is a secondary radical. This next to a halogen. Halogen has unpaired pairs of electrons. And so we're going to be able to delocalize that radical out here on the floor, just like we did with resonance. Therefore, this is going to be the most stable radical, and bromine will add to the simple secondary carbon. Once we have the most stable radical formed, this will simply pick up a hydrogen from another HBr, and that's our product. This one is trivial. We have a primary carbon and a secondary carbon. And we want the radical on the secondary carbon so the bromine will go to the primary carbon. Once we have formed the radical, we will simply abstract the hydrogen. And that's our final product. Finally, our last one here, <clears throat> we have a primary carbon and we have a benzylic carbon, just like carbocation. Benzyl position is magic. It 
will form the most stable carbon cation, and likewise will give us the most stable radical. Therefore, bromine will add to the primary carbon. This will be our radical, the benzyl radical. The benzyl radical will pick up a hydrogen from HBr, and that's our carbon. Remember, this is anti marconicon Okay? And all of these, <coughs> if this was an ionic addition, Bromine would add to the tertiary. Here it adds to the primary. Bromine would add here to make a 1,1 dihalide. Here it adds to the secondary position. It would add to the tertiary, and again it would add to the benzoyl. So this is referred to as anti marconicon Any questions? All right. Our next reaction was the addition of halogen. <clears throat> if you take an alkene of some sort and react it with bromine, chlorine, or iodine, you will add to form a 1,2 dihalide. Now, the 1,2 doesn't refer to uh, nomenclature. It simply means they're on adjacent carbon. <clears throat> the 1 2 dihalide is formed is trans stereochemistry. Now, if you have free rotation here, of course you can't tell, but we'll see lots of examples where you can. Again, the bromines are added to the opposite faces of the molecule. This is also referred to as anti as opposed to trans. Now, the reason that we get trans addition is buried in the actual mechanism of this reaction. It's a very important mechanism. And again, on an exam, quite often I will ask people to draw this mechanism with all of its glorious steps. We recall that the pi system is a nice, rich source of electrons. Bromine, Br2, can split heterolytically. That is, the electrons can go to one bromine and leave this as a positive bromine ion. What happens is the pi system will interact with Br2. The electrons will go to another bromine, kind of like this, and we will form what's known as a bromonium ion. Now, <coughs> When we talked about the addition of HBr, the ionic addition, I said that the intermediate nobody ever talks about is the protonated pi cloud, where the proton just comes in and sits. Well, this is the same thing, except bromine, the bromonium ion sits and is stable. So everybody likes it. Stable, you know, it has a lifetime, microsecond or something, but it still has a lifetime. Bromonium ion is then going to react with Br minus, the one that we liberated here, to give our final product. Now, like I said, this always occurs trans or anti. The reason has to do with the bromonium ion itself. Bromine is big. Okay, remember that. This is what the bromonium ion looks like. Once we put this big bromine on top of this alkene pi system, for the next step, we have to take Br minus and attack either this carbon or this one, right? The two alkene carbons. This is so big that basically Br minus can't get in on either face. It just can't get there. Therefore, the only real path for Br minus to attack is to come in the opposite side. When it does, it opens the bromonium ion, and these two necessarily must be on opposite faces of the molecule. So this 
So it's a simple steric phenomenon. Ammonium ion is so big that the whole top face is blocked. Only way to get in is through the bottom. Any questions? It's always much more believable if there's a movement, right? Here's our mechanism. <clears throat> Again, the pi system reacts with Br2 to give the intermediate bromonium ion. This undergoes backside attack. This opens to give the 1, 2 dibromide. Watch our movies. Step one, <clears throat> bromine is going to come in, it's going to split, and here's our bromonium ion. Once again, this is big. Br minus when all come in the backside. And we're left with a trans or anti 1, 2 dibromide. Any questions? All right, well, let's do some problems. Oh, let me see if I can back that up. <clears throat> I just colored this in, again, just to stress. The ammonium ion is here. It's so big that Br minus can't get in through the top. It has to come in through the bottom. All right, go ahead and put down products for the simple addition of power. On your next exam, <clears throat> we will have all of these reactions. Um, you probably will have a page and a half, maybe even two pages, of nothing but reactions. It's the real thrill of organic chemistry. All right, we have a simple alkene. We're adding bromine. You look at this, and what do you say to yourself? This has a bromonium ion intermediate. I'm going to form a 1,2-dibromide with trans or anti-stereochemistry. Simply going to add a bromine to each carbon. We have free rotation, so trans doesn't mean anything, but it would look something like that. In our next reaction, we have cyclohexene. Same mechanism. We're going to form a bromonium ion. <clears throat> Br minus is going to attack. Remember, the bromines must be exactly opposite each other during this attack step. So that means that the initially formed product here is going to be 1,2-dibromide, where the two bromines are axial. They must be exactly in the same plane. Now, we realize that this isn't going to last very long, is it? In a heartbeat, it's going to be gone, and this is going to go to the more stable diequatorial. But initially, we must form the diaxial because they have to be in the same plane. Our last one here, we have a methyl cyclopentene. <clears throat> Once again, we need to be able to show that our two bromines are going to be trans to each other. So any way that you wanted to show the stereochemistry would work, 
I think something like this works nicely. Again, we have the two bromines on opposite faces of the cyclopentane ring. Any questions? This reaction, like I said, works for bromine, chlorine, and iodine. Now, if you take bromine and you put it in water, you will form a small amount of what's known as hypobromite, H-O-B-R. If you then take that solution and react it with an alkene, you will form what's known as a halohydrate. Allohydrin, that is halogen on one carbon, hydroxyl group on another. <clears throat> There's regiochemistry associated with this. In this reaction, the hydroxyl group is always going to be bonded to the carbon that would give the most stable carbocation. So here we have a primary carbon and a secondary carbon. Most stable carbocation would be secondary. Therefore, in the product, the hydroxyl group is on the secondary carbon, the bromine is on the primary. We also have stereochemistry. These two are also anti or trans to each other. So very, very similar here to the reaction with bromine itself. This also works with chlorine, so HOCl, chlorox, bleach. Once again, hydroxide is going to be at the center that will give us the most stable carbocation. Now the mechanism of this reaction is very, very similar to what we just saw with the addition of bromine itself. Let's go ahead and look at it. Oh, I also wanted to say, instead of just putting bromine in water, <clears throat> quite often in the lab, you will use what's known as inbromosuccinamin. We'll actually use that in lab. Um, NBS, it's abbreviated. Um, this is a succinamid with a nitrogen bromine bond. Um, this breaks down very easily to give the Br plus and the succinamid anion. Um, source of Br plus, and that gives us the uh, product. All right, let's go ahead and look at the mechanism. Now, this mechanism we're going to just pretend we have bromine in water. For our first step, it's going to be exactly the same, exactly the same bromonium ion intermediate. That is, I system will react with bromine to give us the bromonium ion. Now, for a second step, because we have lots of water present, water will simply attack, lose a proton, and we wind up with the trans Allohydrin. Let's watch a movie. Step one. Oh. There it goes. Step one. We're going to react with bromine to give exactly the same bromonium ion. Again, this is big. To make the halohydrin, water is now our nucleophile coming in the backside has a positive charge initially, it'll lose its proton to somebody, and we have our trans allohydrin. Any questions? Very, very, very similar. Same um, stereochemistry, regiochemistry, hydroxyl group on the carbon that gives the most stable carbocation. 
for the one time top part. Why? Well, <clears throat> this is a bromonium ion formed between a primary and a secondary carbon. The actual orientation and charge distribution in this is not going to be identical over both carbons. The secondary carbon here can accommodate the positive charge better. And because it can accommodate it better, it will actually get more of this positive character than the primary. Because of that, when hydroxide adds, it will add to the most positive carbon. And that gives us the observed <coughs> regiochemistry. Any questions? All right. Again, very, very similar to the addition of halogen. Same intermediate. We just add water as our second step. And that hydroxide group goes to the Markonikov carbon. Let's go ahead and do a couple problems. When you look at this, you will say to yourself, addition of HOBr or HOCl. OK, I'm going to get a halohydrin. OH on one carbon, halogen on the other. OH will be bonded to the carbon that would be the most stable carbon pattern. Whenever you do reactions in organic chemistry, you talk to yourself quietly, but talk to yourself. And say these little things, because it just makes it so much easier. For our first one here, we look and we see which carbon in the alkene would give us the most stable carbocation. We have a secondary carbon and a tertiary. Tertiary carbocation would be more stable. Therefore, that is where the hydroxyl group will lie. That means the bromines on the other carbon we have free rotation, so there's no stereochemistry to worry about. And the product would look like that. <clears throat> or our methylene cyclohexane. <clears throat> we have a primary carbon and a tertiary carbon. Most stable carbocation would be here on the tertiary carbon. So that is where the hydroxyl group goes. That means the bromine goes to the other one. Again, it's a single bond, so we don't have to really worry about stereochemistry. And it should look something like this. Methyl cyclopentene, we do have to worry about stereochemistry here, don't we? <clears throat> we have a tertiary carbon, we have a secondary carbon. The tertiary carbon will give us the most stable carbocation. So that is where the hydroxyl group is going to go. Now we have to be able to show our stereochemistry, don't we? We must show hydroxyl group on one face and the bromine on the other. Something like that would work. Hydroxyl group and bromine. Trans or anti to each other. Any questions? All right, so much for the addition of halogens. We know HBr by itself, ionic addition, carbocation intermediate, 
Mark Honikoff, regiochemistry. HBr peroxide, radical intermediate, anti-Mark Honikoff, regiochemistry. Halogen itself, 1,2-dihalide, anti to each other. Halohydrins, and bromodiline intermediate, hydroxyl group binds to the carbon that will give the most stable carbon cation. So that's what we need to know about halogens. We can also react alkenes and make alcohols. Now there's two ways that we're going to do alcohols. One is ugly and brutal. Um, <clears throat> quite often we will get rearrangements. This is simply the acid catalyzed hydration of a double bond. <clears throat> Start off with a simple alkene. We make a simple alcohol. The regiochemistry is Markonikov. <clears throat> so I've shown this is a secondary carbon, this is a tertiary. Therefore, this would be the most stable carbon cation, and that's where the OH group goes. The mechanism of this is going to involve a carbon cation, just like we did for HBr and HCl. Okay? Same basic mechanism. See how simple that makes it? Here's a little movie again. <clears throat> we have a primary carbon, we have a tertiary carbon. Step one, <clears throat> the alkene pi system will accept the proton. We will form a carbocation intermediate. Step two, this carbocation intermediate will react with water. We simply add water to the carbocation lose a proton, and we have the Markonikov alcohol. Let's go ahead and watch. Step one, we're going to protonate on the primary carbon to give us the tertiary carbocation. The tertiary carbocation is planar, of course. Water could add from either face, top or bottom. Water comes in. It's now positive. Simply needs to lose a proton. And we have our tertiary alcohol as our product. Virtually the same mechanism that we talked about with the addition of halogen acids, isn't it? Except instead of halogen anion attacking, we're simply using water as our nucleophile. Any questions? <clears throat> now, just like the addition of halogen acids, any time you make a carbocation, remember you have the potential for rearrangement. Now what that means, and we'll see an example in a second, is that if the carbocation that's formed isn't the most stable carbocation that molecule can make, it will rearrange in such a way to make the most stable carbocation as possible. Now, if you don't really care what your product is, that's fine, but if you're really shooting for a particular product, that makes the reaction fairly ugly. Let's go ahead and do some problems. Write down products for these hydration reactions. And again, on an exam, quite often I will ask you to show the intermediate carbocation and the final product.
we look at an alkene, we have a primary carbon and a tertiary carbon. The carbon cation will form on the tertiary center and will look something like this. For our second step, we're simply going to take water, add the oxygen to this, lose a proton, and we will make the alkene. For our next one, we have a primary carbon and a tertiary carbon. The carbocation will form on the tertiary carbon, and will look something like that. In our second step, water will add to the carbocation through the oxygen, lose a proton, and we will make the alcohol. Now this next guy, <clears throat> our double bond here is between two secondary carbons, but in this molecule we have a tertiary carbon, don't we? We have to protonate one of these alkene carbons, but the most stable carbocation would be here at the tertiary center. Therefore, in our first step, we're going to generate a secondary carbocation. But, like I said, this secondary carbocation is living right next door to a tertiary center. Okay? This would be the most stable carbocation. Therefore, what happens is a rearrangement. In this rearrangement, this hydrogen atom with its electrons is simply going to slide from here down to here to leave the tertiary carbocation. This is a hydride. Hydrogen with its electrons is called a hydride. And it simply slides over. When it does, we're left with the tertiary carbocation. Tertiary carbocation is going to add water, lose a proton, and make the tertiary alcohol. Now, hydride transfers seem like they're magic, but they're really not. Really makes sense. It's really a simple process. And of course, there's a movie for it. Here we have a secondary carbocation next to a tertiary center. The hydride transfer is the hydrogen with its electrons simply sliding over here to leave the tertiary carbocation. <clears throat> this is our, up here in our movie, this is our sp squared uh, primary carbocation. This is a uh, secondary center here, that's sp What happens simply is this hydrogen with its electrons will slide over from one to the other and leave us here with the secondary carbocation. Isn't that neat? You can also move like a methyl group methyl groups, the heavier it is, the harder it is to move. A methyl group will move, but a hydride moves very, very quickly. This is an example of a rearrangement. Anytime you have a carbocation intermediate, you can have a rearrangement. Any questions? Well, Rearrangements could be a real bother, because what if you 
really wanted your alcohol at this center, right? What if you really wanted that? There's another way to make alcohols that avoids the rearrangement. And this is to use mercury to acetate. If we took our <coughs> methyl cyclopentene and we wanted to take an alcohol and we didn't want to have to worry about rearrangements. What you would use is simply mercury to acetate in water. Now, <clears throat> nobody likes to use mercury and wash it down the drain. Okay, that's forbidden these days. But this will work. It will give you Mark Honnikoff free geochemistry without the danger of rearrangement. <clears throat> For a second step, in order to get your final product, you have to dump in what's known as sodium borohydride. Um, that's because the initial product here actually has the mercury bonded to it. Here. <clears throat> the um, sodium borohydride in the second step removes the mercury. Why does this work? Well, because we're going to form what's known as a mercuridium ion. Now you should look at this and say to yourself, wow, that looks just like a bromodium ion, except different, of course, right? So this is our mercurinium ion. And just like <coughs> the um, bromodium ion, this one will go attack by water to give us this addition intermediate. Just like the um, bromo or just like the bromonium ion, this is a symmetric way it's bonded, and the carbon that would give the most stable carbon cation will be the most positive. Therefore, Oxide or water will attack this center, opening the uh, mercurinium ion and giving us this intermediate. Now, this is an organic mercury compound. <clears throat> really bad stuff, fairly toxic, don't want to play with it, so you immediately add borohydride, reduces off mercury, and leaves the hydrogen. Any questions? Let's do an example of a synthesis. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure this exam is certainly your next exam. You're going to be faced with synthesis. In 235, organic 2, you do synthesis all the time. Synthesis, you are given a target molecule, and you have to make it from something. So here's our target molecule, and this is our starting material. Now, the way you would approach this simple, and it's a very simple synthesis, is to look at our starting material and say, okay, I'm converting an alkene to an alcohol, right? <clears throat> I can do that two ways. I can simply add acid and water, go to a carbon cation intermediate, or I can use mercury to acetate, followed by borohydride. Now, if we did the first, that is, if we did a simple acid catalyzed, we would initially form a carbon cation here the tertiary center. However, we have a benzyl center in our molecule, don't we? This molecule will bend over backwards to get this positive charge down to the benzyl carbon. Therefore, <clears throat> you would wind up with a hydroxyl group bonded here. This can only be done with mercury 2 acetate. 
In the two carbons of the alkene, this is the Marconic on carbon, the tertiary carbon. So the OH group will go here, the hydrogen here. There is no rearrangement. It's mercury two acid. Therefore, you would simply say, step one, mercury two acetate water. Step two, four hydride. Any questions? All right, we made it through our halogen additions. We have now made it through the addition of water. We can do it two ways, ionic reaction <coughs> with rearrangements or mercury to acetate, no rearrangement. Both give our Kanakov regiochemistry. Our next group, hydroboration oxidation, reduction, synthesis of 1,2-diols, is synthesis of cyclopropanes. Start here with hydroboration oxidation. Magic words you need to remember. This is going to be anti Markonikov regiochemistry, and the hydrogen and the OH will come on with syn addition. That is, same side. Let's see how this works. Here we have our methyl cyclopentene. <clears throat> this is our tertiary carbon. There's our secondary. Our reaction conditions. We simply react with the H3, usually in a solvent like tetrahydrofuran, TH happens to be true. <clears throat> Second step in the reaction, we're going to dump in peroxide with a bit of base in it. We wind up with an alcohol. The hydrogen and the OH are on the same side of the molecule. That is, either syn or cis. Our regiochemistry, instead of bonding to the tertiary carbon, we bond over here to the secondary carbon. anti markonikov and cis. All right, how does this happen? Well, it happens because we have a concerted addition of hydride, H minus, from our boron compound, BH3. Now, this is actually probably B2H6 at least. It dimerizes. <clears throat> but we're just going to leave it this way. Um, the regiochemistry. There are two things working in our regiochemistry. This is a concerted reaction. That is, hydride is transferred at the same time that the electrons flow down to the boron. Okay? Now, you could imagine this being oriented two ways. <clears throat> this carbon, the tertiary carbon, is better able to accommodate a positive charge. Therefore, it's more attractive to our H minus. The other thing that's a real factor is simple steric bulk. All three of the hydrogens in BH3 can be donated. We'll see that in a second. But <clears throat> um, the boron here can get huge, really big, lots of bulk. So it will always choose the carbon that is the least hindered. <clears throat> so you want the smallest carbon, and you can also just say it's going to the most positive carbon. All right, so we do our concerted addition, and we make what's called a borane. Now, initially there would be hydrogens here, these hydrogens are also donated to another alkene. So you see this gets really big. Okay, <clears throat> because they both come on the same side, concerted, 
It's a simple concerted reaction. This is cis or sin stereochemistry. So this guy is the organic borane. It's a stable compound. In order to get rid of it, we have to dump in alkaline peroxide. When we do, boron is lost and an OH group is put in its place. I'm not going to ask you about the mechanism of this. It's not complicated and it's in the book. But again, OH replaces boron in our second step. Anti Markonikov and sin stereochemistry. This is interesting. Instead of peroxide, if we simply dumped in water, you actually wind up with reduction. That is, this goes all the way to the hydrogen instead of the OH group. To make the alcohol, though, you want alkaline peroxide. Don't forget that. If you get water, it just puts a hydrogen on it. Let's watch a movie. Here we have an alkene. Again, it's a concerted reaction to use the borane peroxide to give the OH group. Simple alkene here. Step one, we're going to bring in our boron hydride. Now note that this is a concerted transition state. So they're both bonding at the same time. When this happens, we wind up with the organic borane. Again, peroxide converts the borane to <coughs> the OH group. Sin stereochemistry. Any questions? Go ahead and draw products for these two simple Hydroboration, oxidation, reactions. We look at our first alkene here. <clears throat> it is bicyclic. Yes, you do have to know how to draw them. We have a tertiary carbon and a secondary. We remember that hydroboration oxidation is going to go anti Markonikov. That means the OH group is going to be bonded to our secondary carbon. Okay. We're good with that one. Now there are two ways you could draw this. You could draw the OH and the hydrogen on this face <coughs> up here by the single carbon bridge or on the bottom face. Now remember I said this reaction was very, very sensitive to steric bulk. Simply, on the top we have one carbon as a bridge and it's difficult to see in my drawing, even though it's beautiful, that in the bottom half here, we have a two carbon bridge. Two is more than one, and so it's bigger. Therefore, this is going to be the least crowded face, and that is going to be our product. Once again, anti Markonikov, and on the least crowded base. One carbon, two carbons. And one is less than two.
Any question? <clears throat> Very simple alkene here. We have a secondary carbon and a tertiary carbon. Know that this is anti Markonikov. Therefore, the hydroxyl group will be bonded to the secondary carbon, hydrogen over here. Don't have to worry about stereochemistry. It would simply look like this. All right, again, alcohols, three waves, ionic addition, Markonikov rearrangement, mercury 2 acetate, Markonikov, no rearrangement, hydroboration oxidation, anti-Markonikov, cis addition. See how simple? It is so simple. You can also convert an alkene to an alkane. <clears throat> now this is a really boring thing to do because alkenes we can do lots of good stuff to, right? Alkanes, not so much. But nonetheless, it is an important reaction. When we do this, we're simply going to use hydrogen gas and one of these rare metals, heavy metals. Platinum, palladium work best. We can also do it with what's known as rainy nickel. Rainy nickel is a very porous nickel um, with the hydrogen already adsorbed to it. So it's uh, kind of a <clears throat> nice, simple reaction. The uh, classic way, however, is to use platinum or palladium. Now, you don't need very much because it's catalytic. Um, and, of course, platinum and palladium are very expensive. The way you do this in the lab for real is you will have um, charcoal, activated charcoal, very, very fine dust, okay? And in that you will have maybe 1% platinum or palladium. So the platinum or palladium is on the charcoal surface. That way you can scoop it up and pour it in, filter it off when you're done, and stuff like that. Works very nicely. In this reaction, you wind up with cis stereochemistry. That means that both hydrogens come on from the same side. Now, the reason this happens is that this reaction happens right on the metal surface. Step one this represents our metal surface. Hydrogen gas will adsorb, that's a D in there, adsorb to the metal surface. When it does, it splits, and you form hydro individual hydrogen atoms um, on this metal surface. All right? Step two, the alkene high system will also adsorb to the platinum or palladium surface. When it does, it just kind of sits down like this. Now, <clears throat> these are the two hydrogens that are going to be bonded to our two carbons. They go on at the same time, on the same face, because this is just the way it happens. Two hydrogens go in, these are the two we just put on, and then this guy has no high system, so it leaves. The two hydrogens must go on on the same face of the molecule. Any questions? Then let's do our problems.
And our first one, we just have a simple alkene, and we're going to make a simple alkane. We know that the stereochemistry of the addition is cis, but it doesn't matter because we're making a single bond, and it would just look like this. Now our next one, we've seen this molecule before, haven't we? <clears throat> Remember, we're going to add both hydrogens to the same face, right? But this thing is going to be on the metal surface. So just like we saw with hydroboration, we're going to try to choose the least crowded face. The least crowded, we said, was a single carbon bridge to the two carbon bridge. Therefore, two hydrogens will go on this side to give us this compound. Here we have a dimethyl cyclopentene. We have to be able to show our stereochemistry. So we're going to draw it in such a way that we can show that both hydrogens are again on the same face of the molecule. Any questions? This is reduction. Very simple. <clears throat> Hydrogen, heavy metal, um, cis or sin addition. Any question? All right. We are now into oxidation. If we take an alkene, we can react it with either osmium tetroxide or potassium permanganate and convert this into a 1,2 diol. All right? <clears throat> the stereochemistry here, just like um, reduction and hydroboration, is going to be cis or sin. <clears throat> that means that both hydroxyl groups are on the same case. Now, potassium permanganate is purple. Um, it's very common. It's cheap. We use permanganate in slightly alkaline solution in water. This is a beautiful reaction. We form MnO2, um, which is insoluble, precipitates out, and you got your dye. Very, very, very simple. The problem with the permanganate oxidation is that it is not quite as high a yield as if we use osmium tetroxide. Now, the problem with osmium tetroxide, however, is it is poisonous as all get out, but it works really well. So if you've spent your entire life isolating some alkene, want to make a diol, you're going to use osmium tetroxide to get some very good yield. However, if you're doing this in lab somewhere and you really don't care, potassium permanganate will give you 80 or 90 percent yield. Very nice reaction. Now why is this sin stereochemistry? Easiest to see with permanganate. We have an intermediate here. <coughs> that is a permanganate ester. So what happens is the MnO4 minus will simply add the Y system here to give us this anionic species. But since both of these oxygens come from the MnO4, they must be on the same side. This is an unstable intermediate. Um, <clears throat> It will break down spontaneously. 
to give us the cis 1, 2, di 1. If you notice, we had a second step when we did osmium tetroxide. We had to add sodium um, hydrogen sulfide. That's because with osmium, this is a more stable intermediate, and you have to cleave it. So that's the second step. Let's go ahead and just do these two very quickly. Osmium tetroxide, sodium hydrogen sulfite, or alkaline permanganate. We'll see that being specific here in saying this is alkaline permanganate is important. convert our alkene carbons into OH groups. Okay? They're going to both be on the same side. Now we have ethyl cyclohexane here. We're going to have substituents in carbons 1 and 2, right? And they must be cis. So think about Axial equatorial here. Remember, diequatorial is trans, diaxial is trans, but axial equatorial is cis. Therefore, this guy, well, you could draw it this way, that's cheating. Or we could draw it uh, with a ring. I don't think I drew it with a ring. <clears throat> but if you drew it as a ring, one would be axial, and the other one would be equatorial. Same sort of thing here. We need to show our stereochemistry. Both hydroxyl groups on the same face. I did it with wedgies. Again, you could draw it a little more elegantly, um, but you just need to show your stereochemistry. One, two diols. <clears throat> Cis stereochemistry, either permanganate or osmium tetroxide. Any questions? All right, now we're going to look at a somewhat interesting reaction. <clears throat> we're going to make cyclopropanes. We're going to make these two ways. We're either going to take chloroform in the presence of strong base. When we do that, we will form a cyclopropane with two chlorines on the carbon that we just added. Or we will use this witch's brew here. This is diiodomethane. And we do this in the presence of a zinc copper amalgam. So that's zinc and copper um, blended together, if you will. And we do this in ether as our solvent. This generates this guy, diazomethane. Now, if you look at diazomethane, this carbon here, or the, this nitrogen triple bond, this would love to be nitrogen gas, wouldn't it? Nitrogen gas is very stable. What it's going to do is take its electrons back so it can leave as nitrogen gas and just leave us with neutral CH2. Neutral CH2 is what we call our B. This is our dichloro. This comes from dichlorocarbene. This is just a simple CH2 that comes from carbene itself. 
Now, what is this carbene? It is neutral. This is dichlorocarbene. We have two chlorines. We have a lone pair of electrons. And we have an empty p orbit. <clears throat> Carbon has one, two, three, four electrons. Its formal charge is zero. So it's neutral. But carbon has two things bonded to it, has its lone pair. It is just reactive as all get out. All the world that happens is dichlorocarbene sits on top of the pi system and makes a bond. Very, very, very simple reaction. Let's watch a movie. The way we make dichlorocarbene is what's known as a 1-1 elimination. 1-1 simply means that both atoms come off the same other atom. Here we're losing hydrogen and chloride anion is leaving. So we're losing HCl. That's why we need a strong base. When we do that, we get dichlorocarbene, neutral. Very, very electrophilic. It simply sits down on the pi system and makes the cyclopropyl. And here's what it looks like. Let's watch this. Starting off with chloroform. Our base is going to come in along the hydrogen and the chlorine leaves. This is dichlorocarbene. Next, we're going to bring in our alkene, and in one magical transition state, which is simply bonds. Any questions? All right, operationally, what do you do here? You look and you say, I'm making dichloro or carbene itself. All I'm going to do is make a cyclopropane ring. If I have chloroform, I need chlorines on our cyclopropane carbon. Go ahead and draw the products for these two simple additions. All in the world you're going to do is convert the double bond to a cyclopropane ring. In our first one, we're dealing with diiodomethane zinc copper amalgam, so we're making CH2 itself. That means our cyclopropane ring is just going to be a CH2 <coughs> bridging our two alkene carbons. Product would simply look like that. Here's our two alkene carbons right here. Methyl group on this side, ethyl on the other. Methyl and ethyl. Our next one is dichlorocarbene. <clears throat> we are going to put <clears throat> cyclopropane ring here. And all in the world we have to remember is to put two chlorines on it. Product would simply look like that. Any questions? Moving 
into our last set here. <clears throat> Isn't that exciting? In this set, we are going to add oxygen, one or two. And in these reactions down here, we're actually going to split our double bond. When we split our double bond, we're going to make carbonyl compounds. But first, let's do this guy. We just did cyclopropanes, right? <clears throat> well, if we take an alkene and react it with hydrogen peroxide, we can make another Remember, ring, but this is an epoxide. So instead of our CH2, we have an oxygen. It's an ether. Let's look at this reaction. Here I have an organic per acid. That's what you usually use. <clears throat> and here we have an alkene. What you do in this reaction is simply take the extra oxygen, if you want to, if you will, and we're going to add this directly to our pi system to form the epoxide. When we do that, we're left with a simple carboxylic acid. Now you might be sitting here wondering to yourself, how in the world does this happen? Well, like this. All of these things happen at the same time. I will not ask you to draw all these arrows, but this is how it happens, just in case you want to know. Basically, we are donating this oxygen. These electrons come up, these go in, pull off the hydrogen here with this carbonyl, wind up with the carboxylic acid and the epoxide. Very, very, very simple reaction. All you have to do is remember <clears throat> alkene, per acid, epoxide. Any questions? Well, then let's do it. molecule up here, our starting thing, a benzene ring with a double bond, that's styrene. Everybody's heard of polystyrene, right? Well, this is the monomer, styrene. If we take that and react it with a per acid, and please note how I've written per acid, way too many oxygens, right? <clears throat> One's a carbonyl, of course, but uh, this is commonly how it's written. We're going to take an oxygen, simply add it to our alkene carbons, and make styrene oxide. Here we have an ethyl cyclohexene. We are going to add our oxygen to our ring. Now, if you think about this in terms of stereochemistry, obviously the oxygens on one phase ethyl group would be sticking up with its hydrogen on this carbon. Or we could just simply draw it out like this. That works fine. Unless I ask you to show stereo. And finally, our last one. How simple can you get? We have a nice, simple alkene carbon. All we're going to do is make this into an epoxide. Now, epoxides are interesting. We are going to um, look at chapter 17 this semester. 
um, skip over a bunch to do 17. I'm not quite sure why we skip over a bunch, but nonetheless, we'll review this when we get to 17. But epoxides are really interesting. It's a three-membered ring, isn't it? It has lots of strain, and we just love to pop them. And so you can react this with nucleophiles and basically open the ring. For example, if we take an epoxide and simply dump it in acid, aqueous acid, for step one, the proton is picked up by the oxygen. That shouldn't surprise you. This looks a lot like hydronium, doesn't it? Once we do this, that really makes these carbons reactive. It really wants to open up now. Water is strong enough of a nucleophile to add, and we get a 1,2 diol. However, look at this 1,2 diol that we just made. What's its stereochemistry? These guys are trans to each other, aren't they? Just like with the bromonium ion, water has to come in the back side. All right, so we know how to make trans 1,2 diols, <clears throat> and with permanganate, we can make cis 1,2 diols. Therefore, if I gave you this problem, Draw me the two products. In our first reaction, we're taking our per acid, reacting it, that's going to give us an epoxide, right? Then we're going to take that whole mixture and just dump it into aqueous acid. So the oxide is going to open, and we will get a 1,2 diol with trans stereochemistry. Diapatorial is trans. Now, initially, we would form diaxial, but of course, it would immediately go to diapatorial. With permanganate, we're going to form an intermediate manganate ester. Both oxygens on the same side. <clears throat> Spontaneously, this is going to break down and give us the one two diol where the two oxygens are cis. Remember, cis is axial equatorial. So isn't this neat? You can make a 1-2 dial with two different stereochemistries. Any questions? Well, it's no longer summertime, and we don't have wonderful thunderstorms coming towards us, right? Unfortunately. <clears throat> but when a thunderstorm comes, quite often you can smell it, can't you? It has this unique smell. Well, that smell is ozone. Now, we know that too much ozone is a really bad thing. Too little ozone in the upper atmosphere, we're all cooked. Too much down here we all die. It's a nice balance. The reason is that ozone is a very reactive molecule. Ozone can react with <clears throat> alkenes to form what's known as an ozonide. O3, basically you're just adding the ozone across the alkene I system. Now an ozonide does have certain stability. However, you can 
work this up with what's known as dissolving metal. We'll do dissolving metal reductions in this course, talk about them. Um, in a dissolving metal reduction, you have aqueous acid, and you just take little bits of zinc metal, and you dump it in, and it bubbles, it fizzes, okay? It's going to form hydrogen gas as it fizzes. Hydrogen gas, as it forms, is actually hydrogen radicals. In a dissolving metal reduction, we capture those hydrogen radicals, and in this case, we capture them with the ozonide. What happens is we split the ozonide and we split the carbon-carbon double bond of the algae. Mechanisms in the book. Uh, don't worry about it, but it's fun to look at. Operationally, if you see ozone followed by dissolving metal, what you're doing is you are splitting your alkene double bond. You are splitting it. Each of these carbons will be a carbonyl. Ozone, dissolving metal, you split the carbon-carbon double bond. Simply take each of the alkene carbons and make them into a carbonyl. Here we get benzaldehyde, this half, blue half, and formaldehyde from our CH2. This is a really neat reaction because aldehydes are tough to make. They are. They oxidize so easily. This is a very nice way to take a simple alkene and make aldehydes. Let's do some simple reactions here. Remember, all you're going to do is split your carbon-carbon double bond, put a carbonyl on each carbon, and that's your product. one, we're simply going to split right here. We have a CH2, that's going to be formaldehyde. This is going to be another aldehyde, going to be acetaldehyde, methyl group and hydrogen. And here's our parent compounds. Just simply split across the double bond. And our next one, <clears throat> we have two methyl groups here, right? So when we split this, this guy is going to be a ketone. This has a hydrogen, so it will be an aldehyde. We simply split, and that's our pair. Now these are fun. <clears throat> because we're going to split, but our products are still going to be hooked together, aren't they? Because it's a ring. Now, when you do these, you look and say, okay, this carbon is going to be a carbonyl of a ketone. Okay? This has a hydrogen, so this is going to be the carbonyl of an aldehyde. And they're going to be separated by one, two, three, four CH2 groups. Ketone, four CH2s, aldehyde. Now I was kind and I drew it this way. <clears throat> but again, you could just draw this as a zigzag. Makes it harder to see.
Here we have hydrogens on both, so they're both going to be aldehydes, right? We're going to have one, two, three CH2s in between them. And it would look like that. Aldehyde, CH2, 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 aldehyde. Any questions? All right, we're <coughs> almost done. When we did permanganate oxidation to make 1,2-diols, I told you, you had to use alkaline permanganate, right? I said that. You remember that? Right. Why? Because if you use acidic permanganate, you split the carbon-carbon double bond. So permanganate in the presence of acid will split the double bond just like ozone did. Only difference is you can't make aldehydes. <clears throat> because as soon as you would make an aldehyde, permanganate is a powerful oxidizing agent. It will convert it to a carboxylic acid. So simply, the rule of thumb is if we have hydrogens, we're going to wind up with oxygens in their places. If it's a CH2, it's going to go all the way to carbon dioxide. Here we have an uh, alkyl group and hydrogen. This is a carboxylic acid. Hydrogens go to oxygens. If we have simple alkyl groups, we make ketones. At acidic permanganate splits the bond. We will make Carboxylic acids, ketones, and CO2, depending on what's attached. All right, not too difficult, really. Here we have two examples. One is <coughs> ozonolysis. The other is permanganate and acid. We look at these and we remember and we say to ourselves, ozone, dissolving metal, I'm going to split, make aldehydes and ketones. Right? That's what we say to ourselves. I'm going to split my double bond right there. This is going to be formaldehyde. This is going to be a ketone. Our next guy is permanganate in acid. We say to ourselves, we're going to split it again, aren't we? But no aldehydes this time. <clears throat> Here we have a tertiary carbon. That's going to be a ketone. This guy has a hydrogen. That's going away. That's going to be a carboxylic acid. So we'll have a ketone and a carboxylic acid separated by one, two, three CH2 groups. Split right there. Ketone, carboxylic acid. Any questions? Now, isn't this the really fun part of organic chemistry? Actually, the really fun part is synthesis. That's really the fun part. 
And that's when you get to take all these reactions, invert something with all the chemistry you know into something else. Unfortunately, we're not going to do a whole lot of synthesis this semester. Rats. <laughs> all right. Let's mix them up. Go ahead and draw the products. When you look at each of them, think about what you say to yourself. reaction we have HCl. What do we say to ourselves? This is going to be an ionic addition. We are going to form a carbocation. Chloride anion will add to that. We could have rearrangements, but we won't. And this is simply going to give us the alkyl chloride. Our second reaction, we look at this and say HBr peroxides. OK, I remember that. That's anti marconikov radical intermediate. I have a secondary carbon and a primary carbon. If it's anti marconikov the radical is going to form on the secondary carbon, and the bromine is going to go to the primary. I'm adding bromine to a carbon-carbon double bond. I'm going to form a 1,2-dibromide. My stereochemistry is going to be trans. This is a ring, so I've got to show that. I can show it with wedgies, or I could draw a really nice cyclohexane chair. Again, I have placed my two bromines here, equatorial, <clears throat> because that would give us the most equatorial substituents. Remember, initially, however, they must both be axial. Ionic addition of HCl again. Hey, we've already done this one. We know this is the carbocation intermediate. We know it can rearrange. We know that the chloride anion is going to bind to the most stable carbocation. That's going to be at the tertiary center. And it would look like that. And we're okay with these four. Yes, sir. This is what your exam is going to look like. Two pages of these guys. Okay? We look at our first one. We have HOBR, we have an alkene. What do we say to ourselves? We say we are going to form an intermediate bromonium ion. We know that the hydroxyl group is going to add to the carbon that would give the most stable carbon ion, but here they're identical. So therefore, all we have to do is somehow show trans stereochemistry. You could do it with wedgies. You could draw it out like this. Aqueous acid and an alkene. Hey, we know that. This is going to give us a carbocation intermediate. It could rearrange. 
but it won't in this molecule. The carbocation will be at this secondary carbon. That means that water will add to that carbon, form an alcohol, and it will look like that. We look at our next one, mercury 2 acetate. <clears throat> mercury 2 acetate, we're going to form an alcohol. It's going to have Markonikov regiochemistry. And we're not going to have to worry about rearrangement. Simply, the, the OH group is going to be bonded to our tertiary carbon. And it would look like that. And our last one for today, HOBR. <clears throat> we know that this is going to form an intermediate bromonium ion. Then we're going to have Mark Anikoff regiochemistry relative to the OH group. That means the OH group will bond to the most stable carbocation. Have a secondary carbon, have a tertiary carbon, the OH will bond to the tertiary, the bromine to the secondary. We know that this is trans addition, but it's a single bond, so we can't really show that. Now, if you're following along with your little sheets, you know that it's really not over, not over till it's over. <laughs> following this is like, oh, six or seven pages of practice problems. What I'd like you to do is to take these guys home and work them. And then next time we have class, so this will be next, what, Tuesday? We will uh, do chapter nine, which is alkyne reactions. But before we do that, we will go through all these, and you can check with the video. All right? Oh, on <coughs> Thursday, today's Tuesday, right? On Thursday. We will do polarimetry. Now, you know, the timing is a little bit off, but polarimetry is the um, device that you use to measure the specific rotation of a chiral molecule. <clears throat> what we're going to use are the little um, lab quest things like we did last time with the GC um, with a polarimeter attachment. So we will have a tube, we'll put various amounts of stuff in there, <clears throat> you will get a curve, and you'll measure the specific rotation of a compound or two. Um, kind of a neat lab. Of course, it's not in your book. Look online. Um, <clears throat> there should be, um, I'm not sure if there's a video for it, <clears throat> but there will be a handout online. So make sure you do that. Okay? All right, see you on Thursday. I didn't put them up yet. Okay, I will. Thank you. <laughs> Probably after chapter five.